Good evening. Ooh. Good evening. Hello. My name is Andrew Hansen. I'm the program director at McLaurin CSF. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 18th annual Paul Homer Lecture. For 18 years now, McLaurin CSF has hosted this annual lecture named in honor of Dr. Paul L. Homer. Dr. Homer was a professor of philosophy and philosophical theology at the University of Minnesota and later at Yale. A devout Christian, Dr. Homer in many ways embodied what has become the distinctive mission of McLaurin CSF, strengthening Christian intellectual life in the Twin Cities and beyond by bridging church and university. Dr. Homer was a distinguished academic, a scholar who was known internationally as an interpreter of Kierkegaard and Wittgenstein. He was also deeply committed to the church Alongside his teaching at Yale, he routinely preached and taught Sunday school. When he traveled for his academic work, he would often contact uh, area churches, offering to serve them by preaching in their Sunday morning services. McLaurin CSF seeks to cultivate this kind of twin commitment to church and university in the Twin Cities. We see our function as analogous to a bridge. On the one end, we want to bring theological resources from the church to bear on the intellectual work that's going on in the university. And on the other end, we want to uh, engage the academic resources of the university for the well-being and the mission of the church. Our Homer lecture is one venue for this work. Each year we bring a nationally known Christian scholar, usually in the humanities or in theology, to the University of Minnesota to speak on a topic that is of special importance for the church and university. Tonight's topic has relevance for all of us, whether we're parents or educators or simply lovers of stories. Scholarship in recent decades on the importance of narrative has confirmed to us that stories aren't just for kids, but they're actually a foundational part of how we view the world. But they are still especially important for kids. Tonight's lecture will help us think carefully about why and how stories matter, informing us into people who can distinguish right from wrong, and more importantly, desire what is right and what is good. Uh, but before we get started with the lecture, I want to take care of just a few preliminary matters. First, if you brought a phone with you tonight, if you just take a moment to put that on silent, both for the sake of your neighbors and because we're recording tonight's lecture. Second, we're going to have a uh, sign-up sheet circulating so that you can sign up and get on our mailing list and stay up to date with all of the uh, latest McLaurin events. We're going to use that sign up list to do a book giveaway tonight. Um, so we're going to be randomly selecting three people from that list to receive one of uh, Dr. Garoyan's books. And at the end of the night, we will announce the winners to that. So please go ahead and sign up for that mailing list if you are already on our mailing, mailing list, go ahead, uh, fill it out again, give us the most current information, and we'll make sure that you get entered in that drawing as well. Third, uh, we're going to have some time for questions after tonight's lecture. So as you're listening, be sure to make note of any questions, um, thoughts that you have, so that we can consider them together afterward. And then finally, Immediately after the lecture, there's going to be an open house just down the street at the McLaurin CSF Study Center. And at the end of the lecture, I will uh, provide a little bit more information on that and give you directions on how to get there. And now it's my privilege uh, to invite Dr. Theophanes Stavrou to introduce tonight's Homer lecturer. Dr. Stavrou is a professor in history and in classical and Near Eastern studies here at the University of Minnesota. He's a leading authority on modern Russian history, as well as Eastern Orthodoxy. And in light of tonight's theme on education, uh, it's especially significant that Dr. Stavrou has been a much beloved teacher and a mentor to hundreds of students during his years uh, since 1961 here at the university. Dr. Stavrou?
It is a great pleasure for me to be with you this evening for a number of good reasons. First of all, I knew Mr. Holmer very well, and uh, his son actually was a student at the University of Minnesota as well, and I attest to the qualities that were just expressed about that wonderful human being and scholar. Uh, secondly, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to introduce our speaker because it's really much more fun and much easier to introduce somebody whom you did not know very well. <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, we are asked to introduce people whom we know, and uh, usually it's easier. Uh, but I really have not met uh, Professor Guroyan until this evening. However, it's not fair to say that I did not know him at all. Uh, his first book, Incarnate Love, in this uh, wonderfully distinctive uh, cover, the first edition, uh, was, uh, has been in my library for a quarter of a century. And it's a, kind of a, it's a kind of a book, really, whether you look at it this way or this way, uh, somehow it grabs you. So uh, uh, you have to look at it. And uh, I was hoping that someday I would meet him, and finally that opportunity came. But uh, I read uh, three of the six or seven essays in this book, and I used them extensively, actually, in my course that I teach on Eastern Orthodoxy at the University of Minnesota. Now, there's another reason why I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker, because it really gives me an opportunity to say something that I do on very few occasions. I wouldn't be standing here before you uh, this evening had it not been for a lovely Armenian lady who in the summer of 1952 went to play tennis on a small tennis court on the island of Cyprus and her friend did not show up. And I happened to show up and my partner did not show up either. So the two of us started playing tennis and after that she invited me uh, to go and meet her husband, and uh, the rest of it is history. Through that wonderful Armenian woman, I began to develop my interest in coming and studying to the United States. <clears throat> of course, Cyprus, where I come from, is a place where we have a lot of Armenians, and in fact we have uh, probably one of the most successful Armenian schools outside in, in the diaspora the so-called Melkonian Institute. So there are a lot of emotional reasons uh, why this is a very special evening with me tonight, and uh, uh, the host for this evening's event told me that I had five minutes to fill, and you may think I've already taken two, but five minutes is a long time. <laughs> Fortu fortunately, fortunately, however, fortunately, however, there is plenty to talk about our speaker. I think he has uh, served the profession from what I was able to determine well. And when I said, it's really more fun to introduce somebody whom you don't know well. It's just like when you're asked to comment on a paper, then you're forced to really do some work. And I did my homework, I think. And uh, in addition to the favorable impressions I had on the basis of the limited exposure I had to this gentleman and his work, it's really nothing short of inspiring to see how well he has served the profession as a teacher, as a publishing scholar, as well as editor, and as a prolific author, as I said, as a publishing scholar. He got his BA from the University of Virginia, and then after that, he got his PhD from Drew University in theology. His first degree was in history. I oftentimes, as I read some of your uh, bio autobiographical or biographical statements and something about your books, I wonder whether you're a historian with a theological bent or whether you are a theologian with a historical perspective. But any way you want to describe yourself, it's really a wonderful combination supplementing these, these two dif disciplines, supplementing each other very nicely. I think it's a matter of credit to our speaker that after having taught at Loyola College in Maryland for about 20 years or so, he returned to his alma mater at the University of Virginia, where he's currently teaching. He's a professor 
of religion there, as well uh, teaching courses on Eastern Christianity, which, by the way, is the most important reason why I was happy to have a chance to introduce him this evening, because he comes from the tradition, and he comes from one of the most venerable and older traditions in, uh, in the Eastern Christian realm, as it were. He has received the Distinguished Teachers Award. He has also uh, spoken in a number of other places besides uh, the place where he is teaching. But, what, but it's really quite impressive that in addition to all this teaching, he's been such a prolific, a prolific uh, publishing scholar. And here are some of his books, which they speak for themselves. Let me tell you, however, why I thought this was going to be a, a wonderful introduction from my point of view. And I thought I was going to have only 50 seconds. And therefore, I selected the opening and concluding line. But since I was given five minutes, then I am doing what I am doing right now. But this is, <laughs> but, 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 but this is really, this is really what I found in, in the various things I looked at. And what a wonderful self-introduction this is. I am a theologian and a college professor. I like being both. But what I, I really love to do, what I get exquisite pleasure from doing, is the garden. I think that gardening is nearer to God than theology. In many respects, really, this introduction, as stated in the statement, is sufficient. But then, you're all scholars, and you want evidence, right? All right, therefore, here comes the evidence that his first book, published in 1987, and then it went in paperback in 1989, known as Incarnate Love, Essays in Orthodox Ethics. A wonderful first attempt from this young scholar, I think, to interact and engage really thinkers, Christian thinkers, uh, from various branches of Christianity. His second publication, Tending the Heart of Virtue, how classic stories awaken a child's moral imagination, close to the topic that we are going to hear about tonight. And then he continued on with Inheriting Paradise, Meditations on Gardening. And of course, how, uh, how shall we remember? And this is an important detail in the life of this gentleman because as you gather from the name, and as you gather from my introductory remarks, uh, he's an Armenian. And when you are an Armenian, uh, you simply cannot forget uh, the past, and especially the unfortunate events of 1915, where, in other words, the Armenians uh, suffered uh, a tremendous assault, which can be described by any name, but in the final analysis, it really amounted to what it was, namely almost extermination of those people. Anyway, he's published a book, really, on that very topic. And uh, he also continues his publication uh, by, with a book which you have seen outside, The Fragrance of God, A Spirituality of Gardening, The Melody of Faith, Theology in an Orthodox Key, and currently he's expecting a book to come out of Oxford University Press on Orthodox Theology on Marriage. So he's been a very busy person, as you can tell. And I'm mentioning all these titles, not really uh, because one gets impressed by titles, because of the writing of books there is no end, as somebody pointed out. But I mention, I mention it really chiefly because what impressed me about what I have been able to determine and what I'm looking forward to really uh, understand better is that our distinguished guest uh, this evening has really drawn, always, in all the studies that I have, at least I have looked and what I've read about, he draws on the scriptures, he draws on the church fathers, he draws on scholarship by Western theological thinkers as well as the scholars of uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church. And this is really quite an arsenal, quite a combination of sources that he brings uh, with him when he makes his presentation. And I'm sure that's going to reflect itself very easily in, this, in the presentation he's going to make tonight, which you have in front of you. But again, 
just to complete my four and a half minutes, has the title, The Moral Imagination, Cultivating Virtue Through Great Children's Stories. For all these good reasons, it really is a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Vigen Gorian to give the 18th McLaren Lecture, the Holman Lecture, sponsored by the McLaren Institute. Professor Gorian. I've never had an introduction like that, but I've never been introduced by a, a Greek uh, academic uh, in such a setting either. Uh, you, you should expect a talk from me on Orthodox Christianity, but uh, it won't be. I will cite one Orthodox theologian, however, so. I haven't left it behind. Um, Professor Stavro was kind. He could have called me a dilettante and uh, left it at that. Sometimes I think I am. My feet are in too many places at once, and I trip a lot. Um, first of all, uh, uh, as far as Paul Homer is concerned, I, I actually uh, know of him, but never met him. I know of him because one of my early colleagues at the University of Virginia, where I taught right out of uh, graduate school from 78 to 81 and then returned many years later, was a student of his in philosophical theology. And all I heard about was Paul Homer um, and learned to appreciate the man at a distance. Um, it was a, a surprise and an amazement to me so many years later, 30, 35 years later, to be invited to give a, a lecture that's named in his honor. So I do have a connection with that. My, my subject matter tonight is, uh, grows out of my personal life uh, every bit as much as, as out of my academic life. Um, my children are now in their 30s. Well, my daughter just reached 30, my son's 34, and I have now two grandchildren, one who's two and one who's three months, and I'll see them tomorrow. Um, so maybe I can go back to doing what I did with my children, which was read constantly to them children's stories. But at a certain point, I couldn't read those stories to them any longer because they wanted different stories. But I was attached to the very early stories. So I went to my dean at the time at Loyola College and asked him if he would give me a small stipend, because they were giving out such things at that point, um, to, com to, to c put together a course on children's literature. I was in the theology department. Well, a man has to be forgiven. He was a chemist. <laughs> Worse still, he was what I call a flat planet. He had no conception of what this would do in a curriculum. So he told me, maybe you should go talk to the people in the, uh, the Department of Education. I said, they, they teach bibliography. They don't teach the stories. They, they, they teach bibliography. They won't be interested in this. That's, for those of you who are in education departments, you may be insulted by that, but that was the case. I knew that. So, so uh, 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 he didn't give me a stipend, uh, flat planet that it was. Um, <laughs> I can forgive him for being a chemist because I wanted to be a chemist. My math wasn't very good, so I gave it up, but I really did want to be a chemist. Um, I had one of those old chemistry lab, you know, they used to sell them back then, you know, things that they won't give children anymore. And, <laughs> and I had a friend whose father was an inventor. He invented the, the pulleys and uh, the old-fashioned windows, you know. And he had a great laboratory, and when he died, he gave me the whole lab. I still have some of the glassware. It's probably worth millions. Of not really, but, but there was lots of sulfuric acid and phosphorus and mercury. It's a wonder I'm alive. <laughs> um, I once tried to make mercury fulminate, which is what they put at the tips of uh, torpedoes. And I was frightened because I came up with something, so I buried it in my father's garden. <laughs> and it's still there. <laughs> So for 20, 25 years, I've been teaching a course on religion and children's literature. And I've, uh, when I uh, came 
went back to UVA, I taught it, uh, this will be the third or fourth time I'll teach it uh, the next spring. It fills up in three hours. I only, I limit it to, you know, the online these days. When I was a college student, we, we, we chose our courses on index cards. Um, I got limited to 30 students. Um, and uh, my book grew out of that seventh or eighth year of teaching the course, and uh, I owe Oxford a, a second and expanded edition, which I hope to finish one day. But let me begin um, by simply reading to you and commenting as I go along. Uh, these are, they, these are, are troubling times for our children, and the range of uh, dangers that exist, physical, moral, and spiritual, should not be understated. They should not be underestimated. And in this environment, the great moral question of character and virtue becomes paramount, particularly in our roles as uh, parents and teachers. Despite the chatter of all the modern sophists that reach us through the various media who profess that there is nothing absolute or permanent in morality, we are compelled to confirm the enduring and permanent things. More than this, we must not only affirm, but also cultivate these things in the lives of our children. And that's what compelled me to write the book that I wrote. Those of us who are Christians believe that the universe in which we live is a moral one, governed by a just and gracious God. And we believe that our lives are of eternal value and significant. So the kind of ship into which we cast our children off into the sea of life makes a difference as to whether they sink in, into the abyss or reach the shores of paradise. Education is not just about teaching learning skills or training young people how to be well adjusted. It is most importantly about making virtuous people. It is about cultivating the child's soul so that she is a temple fitted for the Holy Spirit. Quickly. I was invited some years back by um, a member of the faculty of the business school at Fordham University in Manhattan who wanted to play a trick on the rest of the faculty. I had a faculty lecture uh, every year, invited a speaker. So he asked me to speak on why businessmen should read great literature. And I, at one point, said that you are in the business of dealing with human souls and their formation. And I have to tell you, there was a grumbling, more than a grumbling, an objection to the notion that first there was a soul, and secondly, that we had any business dealing with this in our education. Now, that was even more pleasurable. From there on, I knew that I was going to have a great wrestling match. <laughs> I had them captive, too, because I was at the podium. Um, Yes, um, it is about making virtuous persons, and it is about cultivating the child's soul. It is a, about building up in the child a moral imagination that will serve her throughout the whole of life. Dare we say, even it is about nurturing those virtues Jesus spoke of on the Mount of Beatitudes. First, let us consider the virtues to which the moral imagination is in service. The virtues are like gems. Each is solid with a permanent color and shape. If we throw a diamond into a pond, let it stay for a thousand years. The diamond will not change or diminish in beauty, and there will be no mistaking it for a common stone. The virtues are like that. They are among the permanent things of divine and human nature, and they, and they possess an enduring quality. We have names for the virtues. Every great religion and culture has names for the virtues. Among these are love and justice, faith and courage, temperance and hope. If we embrace and practice the virtues, they become our habit. And holiness is even within our reach. St. Peter tells us that, and I quote him, we, we, we may become partakers of the divine nature. He then goes on to say, however, that in order to make good this gift of the Spirit, we ourselves must, with all diligence, add to our faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, 
and to perseverance, godliness. Second Peter, chapter 1. So we should not be ashamed to say that we want our children to be just, or good, or holy. We should not hesitate to say, even to those who have completely forgotten the meaning of holiness, or do not believe in its reality or possibility, that our children should be holy. Rather, we should take instruction and encouragement from Christ, who instructed, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The virtues are our path to becoming fully human. They define and constitute character. They are precedent even to the choices we make. We do not invent them. Rather, they belong to human nature, and human nature is not whole without them. They direct our will so that our actions serve goodness and justice. No one chooses to be courageous any more than he or she chooses to be cowardly. One is either courageous or one is cowardly. There is no in-between. When we say a person is courageous, we mean that the virtue of courage belongs to the very essence of who and what that person is. How do the virtues come into existence? They come to exist through example and exercise, initially in the home, and hence uh, uh, through the offices that we first assume as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, and then in the school or in the playing field. The virtues grow into habits that define the will, even before volition. Moral character, a virtuous character, is therefore a habitual orientation of the self toward the world that disposes a person to act out of a sense of what is right and to do what it, that which is good in every instance. So think of the virtues as the powers of habit that enable us to avoid evil and to do what is good and to grow into wholeness and holiness. Moral rules and principles are not sufficient. They need the virtues in the moral imagination. Their application for good or ill depends entirely upon the character of the agent and the spiritual light of the moral imagination that illumines the landscape of a person's life. If we merely memorize moral rules and principles without the support of virtue or the moral imagination, we can just as easily use these rules and principles for selfish and pernicious purposes as for the good. Sailors need to know <clears throat> when to use ballast or throw down the anchor lest the ships sink and they drown. Likewise, the virtues enable us to respond correctly to those moments of life that are the moral equivalents to such conditions at sea. However, an ability to discern these moments and respond appropriately entails more than formal techniques of decision making, just as successful sailing requires that one knows more than precisely the tech the techniques of good navigation, as the latter requires a knowledge, uh, as the as the latter requires a knowledge and familiarity with the sea. Um, so, uh, in the case of the moral life, uh, the virtues are the basis of all of our actions that we may count uh, as as good and as directive uh, toward. Um, the perfection of our character. In his profound essay, the, 20, the Education of Character, Martin Buber, that great Jewish philosopher of the 20th century, tells a story that illustrates this point. He, he re recalls an early experience while teaching a course on ethics and explains how he committed the terrifying mistake of giving mere moral instruction and rules and principles, rather than attending to the formation of character in his pupils. I quote, I try to explain to my pupils that envy is despicable, and at once I feel the secret resistance of those who are poorer than their comrades. I try to explain that it is wicked to bully the weak, and at once I see a suppressed smile on the lips of the strong. I try to explain that lying destroys life, and something frightful happens. 
the worst habitual liar of the class, produces a brilliant essay on the destructive power of lying. Uh, whether a carpenter, whether or not a carpenter is a good man, will not necessarily determine the effectiveness of how he handles a saw or a hammer or the quality of the cabinets that he builds. But morality is different. Moral rules and principles are not mere tools like the carpenter's saw and hammer. The correct use of moral rules and principles, as, as, as he's illustrated in what he has just said about his early teaching experience, depends entirely upon the character of the agent and the manner in which the agent inhabits the world. That's the point that Bubu made so profoundly in the citation I just gave to you. Likewise, law is not the heart and soul of morality either. The old legalism that imagines it can cover every contingency of life with rules and sanctions is just as flawed as the reformist doctrine which prescribes that all one need do is teach children to think for themselves and they will find a moral compass as if they can invent their own math. A child wants to know the fixed things, not the shifting. G.K. Chesterton once wisely observed and went on to say, for the child enjoys the sea, not the tides. He cannot decently be expected to learn to respect humanity, which is often a hard thing to do, and at the same moment to learn to improve it. Chesterton also believed that stories are the most powerful medium through which we can acquaint young people with these fixed or permanent things of the moral life and not the shifting sands or the waves. He believed that we live storied lives. And so it is to stories and their special capacity to engender the virtues, build character, and birth the immoral imagination to which I turn now. In my own teaching of college students, I regularly invoke stories and bring them into the classroom. Though I do not belong to a department of literature, nonetheless I also regularly assign literature and poetry in my courses. I begin my course on ecology, Christianity, and culture, reading poetry and hymns, which astonishes most of the students in the class who are environmental studies majors of one kind and cannot comprehend how this could do with policy studies. Same rule applies. I said, who, who does policy? What is the character of the people who do policy? I want to affect your sensibilities. I'm not interested in discussing policy. You'll get more than enough of it in all of the other classes that you take. That's how I start. And it's a wonderful experiment. And it works. Now, um, Stories are especially important in children's lives because, because uh, they make up for the life experience they lack, these stories, or for which they are not yet prepared in the case of children. They introduce children to the virtues through characters with which they may identify as they themselves struggle to exercise their freedom imaginatively and responsibly in relation to their families and friends and the rest of their growing world. Stories bestow images to memory that become metaphors for a moral imagination. The moral imagination is built up from these analogies and metaphors, for it is through such analogies and metaphors that we gain the capacity to draw correspondences in life that enable us to act responsibly and to make moral judgments. As I have been saying, rote memory does not make moral behavior. An eminent philosopher of the last century, George Santayana, st once stated, and this is a striking statement, um, I stop when I read it always, our perceptions do not remain in the mind as would be suggested by the trite simile of the seal and the wax, passive and changeless until they fade. Rather, perceptions fall into the brain as seeds into a furrow, or even as sparks into a keg of powder. And these images, in turn, give life to more images, sometimes slowly and subterraneously, sometimes with a sudden burst of fancy. 
end of quote. And here, I might add, is the store of what I'm calling the moral imagination. In other words, the moral imagination is active, not just in our conscious and waking life, but also in our subconscious, even as we sleep. It is the self's ongoing process of finding moral direction and purpose in life. It is neither reason nor instinct, but rather an attribute and expression of the freedom and the passion, the memory and reason that distinguish human beings from the rest of the animal kingdom. And for an audience such as this, need I emphasize what a difference it makes in our lives, especially in our early years, what kind of images reach our eyes and our minds, and that we even experience in our bodies, in the whole of what and who we are as human beings living in a social world. We must never underestimate the power of images, whether pictorial or communicated through word and story. The contemporary Orthodox theologian Andrew Loth has said, and I quote him, that images mediate. Images bring one thing in relation to another. Images make meaning. And they do this because this is the way things are. This is the way God has made the world. St. Basil of Caesarea said, God imagines the creation into existence. He doesn't, and I go along with that. He doesn't reason it. He doesn't, it's not a function of what we call intellect. God imagines it into existence. Those images become real. He makes them real. And they're contemplated from eternity into eternity. And I think that's what Louth is getting at here. So he says, and they do this because this is the way things are. This is the way God has made the world. And it all relates and interconnects, and images reveal this relationship and interconnection. Now in our time, which one could rightly name the age of the tyranny of images, when all the wrong sorts of images reach our eyes, we have to be especially attentive to their significance. We must not take them for granted and be ever vigilant for our ch children's sake, for the images that reach their eyes and penetrate their imaginations. Why? Because Satan is the great pretender and the imitator of God, that's why. He knows the power of images and he uses them to deceive and seduce our imaginations. There, I've said it. It's not supposed to be said in academic settings. So what? I'm too old to care. <laughs> Besides, I have two grandchildren to worry about. So let's think of the moral imagination as a special form of perception. It is light, like the light that enters the eyes and enables one to see. Whilst in the darkness there is much that we cannot and do not see. Moral vision is the capacity to tell goodness from evil and respond in each circumstance to bring goodness about rather than evil. So much of the moral failure in our world is a failure of imagination, not just of a will that chooses to do what is wrong. Let me repeat that because I, the, older, the, the longer I've lived, the more I've come to the conclusion that this is, this is the case. So much of the moral failure in the world is a failure of imagination and not just of a will that chooses to do what is wrong. Satan attacks not only our reason and will, but also our imagination. Indeed, as all the saints testify, he goes first to the imagination. Phantasmagoria. They need to be expelled. He corrupts and distorts it into forms with which we are all too familiar, though we may choose to ignore or deny their existence. Worse, there are dysmorphic and corrupted forms of imagination that in our time threaten to completely crowd out the moral imagination, like weeds in an untended garden. There are three such forms of imagination that warrant special attention. First is the idyllic imagination. 
The idyllic imagination is escapist, not necessarily in the sense that it flees physical surroundings, but rather that it shirks civic and social and personal responsibility. In its rebellious or revolutionary form, which I'm quite acquainted with as a child of the 60s, it denies and strives to destroy old, old dogmas, manners, and mores. In its search for the idyllic, it might also turn to hedonistic imaginings and flagrant sensuality as it seeks liberation from existing conventions and norms. The second is the idolatrous imagination, so rampant in our society today as it has been, that, is, that it has built its own cult of celebrity, our version of the pagan pantheon of divinities. And today we, celeb we call celebrity idols icons. Now, some time ago, Christianity made a distinction between idols and icons. We've completely confounded these two to our great and grave danger, it seems to me. This is not just a harmless confusion of terms. And the adoration we give these stars, whether of cinema, sports, or in politics, comes not without damage to the soul. The third deformation of imagination is the diabolic imagination. Not much need to be said about it than the name. Oftentimes it takes hold of us when the idyllic and idolatrous forms fail us. Neither idyllic fantasies nor man-made divinities can satisfy the soul's yearning for communion and happiness. The diabolic imagination is a dive heels up, to use a phrase of Dostoevsky, into complete desolateness. It is spiritual suicide, followed by physical suicide. But it is the moral imagination about which I speak. And in order that we may apply moral rules to a right result, the moral imagination has to be in place. And it must be active. Yet modern education largely ignores this truth. And I believe we are failing to introduce our children to a world of metaphors and symbols upon which the strength of the moral imagination depends utterly. The great Victorian inventor of fantasy literature, one of my favorites and perhaps some of yours, George MacDonald, observed that if we wish to develop the moral imagination in, in children, and I quote him, no doubt the best beginning is an acquaintance with nature. How much nature do you see or hear with ear pods in your when you shut your ears off, you shut your eyes, too. The senses work together. It's tragic. You're walking along the grounds at the University of Virginia, beautiful grounds, and the leaves are rustling, and my students don't hear them, nor do they see them, because they don't hear them. They don't see them because they don't hear them. They don't hear them because they don't see them. And it has its results, its consequences. So he writes, no doubt the best beginning is an acquaintance with nature. Thus, MacDonald argued that children should be encouraged, quote, to observe vital phenomena. He doesn't mean scientifically either. Poetically observe them, too. To put things together, to speculate from what they see to what they do not see. End of quote. The sort of attentiveness to nature that MacDonald recommends runs much deeper than even the sort of observation and experimentation that nat natural science calls for. And need I mention how much we neglect this form of observation in daily life? Leave aside informal education. McDonald was recommending an exercise in poesis, an exercise in the use of language to get to the very quiddity or essence of things, to see the world in its wholeness, and to find meaning in our relationship to the world. And he reminds us that even in, uh, I quote him, the coldest word was once a glowing metaphor and bold, questionable originality. Thy very attention, he writes, does it not mean attentio, the Latin, a stretching to? Take any word of emotion, take the word emotion itself, he continues, and you will find that its primary meaning is of the outer world. The rustling and agitation of the trees is analogized to the self and its inner disturbances, thus emotion. 
the imagination grasps the symbolic nature of the world itself and transforms human language and knowing in the process. And if we don't, if we don't prepare our children, they'll put them in the proper environment in which they go through this process at the earliest age, we fail them, period. And we're failing them, monstrously so in my view, really failing them. For many years, I taught at Loyola College in Baltimore. And in, in my ethics course, I am an ethicist after all. Well, that's one of my hats. In my ethics course one year, I assigned Walker Percy's novel, The Thanatos Syndrome, the last of his novels, a crazy novel. The, the protagonist of his story is a character we've met before in his novels, a psychiatrist named, of all things, Thomas Moore. Moore has a theory about human types, and we learn about this very early, very first pages. He divides his patients into those who are bluebirds and those who are blue jays. It became apparent to me that my students did not understand Moore's metaphor. So I asked the students, 60 of them in two sections, if they knew the respective habits and temperament of bluebirds and blue jays. There were maybe four or five out of those 60 students that could describe both and fewer that could explain why there was a contrast between a bluebird and a blue jay. Now, when I was a child, I was outside. It wasn't always good. I got muddy. I came home late. My parents put it to me, and I did it again. But I was outside chasing frogs and things like that. And I watched birds, even. Yeah, I watch them more now because my children say I'm getting addled and aged. But I, I, I think of the birds as the fish in the sea that have that glorious uh, advantage of floating around in the sea. And what are we with? It's the, the, the crustaceans that crawl around the bottom, you say. So I envy the birds. But my, my students obviously never observed birds. They were, so they were all suburban kids. Um, maybe the birds didn't even come to their yards anymore because we've taken away all the trees and the foliage that the birds actually uh, feed off of or nest in. But in any case, what a sad thing to observe in young men and women. They couldn't get the metaphor. I did the same one th thing with uh, metaphors in, in John Updike's Rabbit Run. I gave him a test on, give me five metaphors in the book. Some of them didn't even identify the title. <laughs> Seriously. That doesn't mean I don't love my students, I do, but something's missing. I can't make up for it entirely, not by that time. It's, uh, it's not that my students lacked a practical definition of a metaphor. They, they were given that in their English courses. I know because I had good friends in the English department. And I asked them about this. They had been provided with a definition of a metaphor, but what they lacked was the habit of observation and poesis to which MacDonald refers. They lacked the personal knowledge of metaphor, which only an active moral imagination engenders. I not only suspect that they spend too much time indoors looking at a screen or outdoors equipped with earbuds, I also am sure that they spent years in school being taught that learning is about collecting facts from specially prepared books that require little interpretation. We live in a culture where metaphor is discarded to make room for these so-called facts. The practice is justified by the prejudice that these facts, and exclusively so, in, in, in them resides the truth. So we train minds to detect these facts, much as we break in a baseball glove. For those who remember how to do that, you know, you used to oil the glove and <laughs> wrap it up, you know, and wait for overnight, magic will occur. Meanwhile, the imagination is neglected and it's left unguarded and untrained. In the last analysis, the moral imagination is that distinctively human capacity to conceive of men and women as moral and spiritual beings, as persons and not as things. In other words, to recognize that the human face is itself a window into spirit, spirit which might otherwise be hidden from us. The best of humankind stories possess a special power to perceive spirit in the world. 
and thus to recognize and affirm truth through metaphor. In this case, my use of window is a metaphor. And I hope here you will excuse the theologian for using the speech with which he is most accustomed for the imago Dei, the image of God that every human being is. Image of God. We are images of God. Images. Need I remind you of how inferior and destructive are so many of the stories that feed the popular imagination? Creative television, video, computer games, cinema, advertising. These stories have replaced other profound stories that once played such a, a vital role in the formation and handing on of faith and culture. The wisdom I recommend is universal wisdom, and it's next to tragically being forgotten or, or uh, uh, ignored, either out of laziness or just for the sake of profit. In Plato's Republic, Socrates rhetorically asks, Shall we then thus lightly suffer our children to listen to any chance stories fashioned by any chance teachers and so take into their minds opinions, for the most part contrary to those we shall think it desirable for them to hold when they are grown up? By no, mean, by, by no manner of means will we allow it. Biblical illiteracy is given in my theology classes, so too illiteracy of the classics, but this is not the end of it. Illiteracy in the great fairy tales is just as pervasive. In my writing and speaking, I've urged a return to the tried and true fairy tales that the Victorians and Edwardians in the English-speaking world of the 19th and early 20th century brought into the nursery and the schoolroom and also those stories they created themselves. G.K. Chesterton wrote of the test of fairy land. This is the test of imagination, he wrote, and this test of imagination concerns moral truth. Chesterton insisted. But moral truth is different from mathematical truth. He wrote, you, can ima you cannot imagine two and one not making three, but you can imagine easily trees not growing fruit. And I add, but rather rock candy, since I loved that song when I was a child. Um, the lesson of Fairly End, however, is not that tomorrow morning you or I should expect to find growing in their backyard a tree whose limbs are weighted down with rock candy. The magic of fairyland is not physical or biological science. A fairy tale may tell of an evil witch who possesses the mysterious power to turn a good prince into a stone and a fairy godmother with the equally mysterious power to turn that stone prince back into his rightful self. But the veracity of the moral, uh, the veracity of the moral truths illumined by these two inhabitants of fairy tales does not depend upon an explanation of their powers, as would be perhaps with science. Oh, fairy tales are not science, though they are a way of knowing every bit as important to human well-being as scientific knowledge. If we look in the fairy tale for an explanation of the transformative power of the fairy godmother, as we look for an explanation of science of how liquids turn into solids, we are bound to come up empty-handed and disappointed. Rather, the magic of the fairy tale lies in its capacity to make us see that we, each and every one of us, are capable of committing both the evil of the wicked witch and the good of the fairy godmother. The great fairy tales enable us to see what is the difference between good and evil and judge whether we ourselves are like the wicked witch or like the fairy godmother. And children are great at that experiment. The great fairy tales challenge us to test our imaginations in our imaginations. How we would respond to, circum to circumstances in which good and evil are in the balance. They invite us to make correlations between the imaginary characters and worlds they depict and the world in, in which we live. In this way, fairy tales exercise and build up the moral imagination, and they engender virtue. Plato argued that conversion to that which is moral, that which is just, that which is right and good is like an awakening, like remembering something long forgotten. Symbols, allegories, fables, myths, and good stories, they have a special capacity to bring back to life the starved or atrophied moral imagination. 
Thus, through dramatic depictions between the struggle, the struggle between good and evil and the presentation of characters that embody and enact the possibilities therein, moral vision clears. Light comes into our eyes. An illumination of our dark, darkened intellects, a warming of our frozen hearts. Fairy tales are not scientific hypotheses, nor are they practical guides to living but they do something even better. They resonate with the deepest qualities of our humanity. They have the capacity to draw us into the mystery of morality and virtue. And they enable us to envision a world in which there are norms and limits. And freedom respects the moral law or pays an especially high price. Fairy tales show us that there is a difference between what is logically possible and what is morally felicitous what is rationally doable, and what is morally permissible. In fairy tales, the character of real law, the character of real law belongs to neither natural necessity nor rational determinism. Rather, real law is a comprehensible sign of a primal, unfathomable freedom and a numinous reality and will. Real law, the realest law, can be obeyed or broken. And in either case, for the very same reason, because the creature is both subject of and participation in this primal freedom. And even the smallest child knows that freedom to be welling up inside him or her. We have to respect it, and we have to instruct it. I, I can't say much more. Fairy tale heroes are called to be free and responsible, thus virtuous and respectful of the moral law. <clears throat> After a child has read Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen, it's a magnificent, this best, really, uh, or C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles, or Grimm's Cinderella, not Disney, not Peralt for that matter, which Disney based is but Grimm's Cinderella. The moral imagination is sure to have been stimulated and sharp, sharpened because these stories offer powerful images of good and evil, and they show a child how to love or act with courage through the examples of the character he or she has come to love and admire. And the memories of these stories and these characters become the analogs that the moral imagination uses to make real life decisions, whether consciously or unconsciously. And these memories become constitutive elements of a, a child's self-identity and character. So that a well-fortified and story-enriched moral imagination helps children to move about in the world with moral intent, and ultimately with faith, hope, and charity. When the moral imagination is wakeful, the virtues come to life, and they're filled with personal and existential as well as social significance. The virtues needn't be dry and lifeless data of moral theories or the ethical version of hygienic rules and health science classes. They can take on a life that attracts and awakens the desire to own them for oneself. And that's what the best children's stories, the great classic children's stories do. I don't want to leave you with the impression that fairy tales are only for the very young. For more than, well, more than 20 years now, as I mentioned, I taught a college course titled Religion in Children's Literature. And each year, the young men and women speak up in the seminar to say that they were deprived in their childhood of these resources. Many of them do. Most of them, actually, in the end. Not only were they not introduced to most of the stories, and books on the syllabus, but they also recognized that their natural sense of wonder was deprived in, in some fashion or another. I know why they're in there, too, because they want to revisit their childhood, because they know, know where they're going next. They're leaving college, and so they come. They want to revisit it for the last time. But what stuns them is, is that what they're revisiting is not what they think they're going to revisit is not all that they will be revisiting because so much of it has been left out of their family life and education. 
So I, I don't have to persuade them that the tasty food of fairy tales and classic stories that we read in class is good for the soul. Books like Bambi, The Secret Garden, The Wind in the Willows, The Fairy Tales of the Brothers Grimm, Hans Christian Andersen, George MacDonald's The Princess and the Goblin, goes, this goes on. My, my students take advantage of these stories to revisit childhood for one last time, and it's, it's a wonderfully satisfying experience for them, but also for me. They also uh, find themselves looking back uh, in order to look forward, and they especially enjoy and are, are perplexed by Peter Pan, the real Peter Pan, not Disney, <laughs> the play or the novel. We read the novel, which Barry wrote after the play was a great success, and the Mowgli stories in, the, in Kipling's Jungle Books. Since they are about two children, who don't want to grow up or join the real human world. But these stories end differently. Peter refuses to join the lost boys in the Darling household, and he returns to Neverland instead and remains a child and a prisoner of his own passions, though he continues to think this is freedom. And by contrast, the love and the wisdom of his animal mentors help Mowgli to mature as a moral being and he struggles with choices and takes responsible action to protect beasts and human beings whom he loves and his character is refined and he re-enters human society a mature young man. Not without agony, but he re-enters it. But then agony is part of it, not just in Mowgli's life. Now I recognize that the view I have expressed, uh, views I have expressed do not belong to the common stock of contemporary educational orthodoxy. I've read much of the literature on children's literature because I need, feel as if I need to be responsible for it. But frankly, I don't find it of much use, honestly, um, because it's not interested in these subjects matters, more, more or less. Um, I realize that the appeals I make to a common human nature and a perennial literature defy postmodernist premises that even affect our views on ordinary pedagogy, though there are many who receive these views unaware of just what the underlying anthropology is, and that gives rise to these views. But the stories say it all. They speak of things that are perennial, such things as the, the joy of the birth of the first child and the crippling sorrow of illness and deformity, childhood fears of getting lost matched by childhood desires to escape parental authority, the love that binds siblings and the rivalry that tears them apart, the naming we do that gives identity and the blessings of welcome benefactors, the agony of unrequited love and the joy of love that is reciprocated. That's the stuff of the best stories, including the stories we, we can read to our children. I believe in moral truths that enable us to live and prosper and which are no less important to living than the nutrition we receive from food and drink. Especially when young, we need to be fed on these truths as they come to us through the great stories of our race. I agree with all my heart and mind what G.K. Chesterton leaves us with when he says about, uh, speaks to us about our responsibility to children as adults, as parents and teachers welcoming them into this world. He wrote, the truth of our human tradition and handing it on with a voice of author, author, uh, authoritative, un, uh, an authoritative, unshaken voice, that is the eternal education. To be sure enough that something is true, that you dare tell it to a child. Now, I'm almost finished, but I do want to say a word or two about a particular story. I'm often asked, what is your favorite fairy tale? Well, which is it that above all others ought we to read to our children at home or in the classroom? Mm -hmm. This is really an impossible question to answer. And the answer I give is not one I'm confident that parents and teachers will actually accept once they read it for themselves. But if they read it to their children, they might be persuaded. And that story is Carlo Collati's Pinocchio, which was first published in 1883. 
I chose it for the first of the stories to discuss in my book, Tending the Heart of Virtue, the title of the chapter on Becoming a Re Real Human Child. In that chapter, however, I did not act so much as a theologian as the ethicist. I did not emphasize as much as I might have the brilliant way in which Collaudi integrates into this tale of a puppet profound themes and narrative elements from classical literature, the Bible, and Christian liturgy, really. In his own education, Collodi imbibed and took to heart Homer's Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, Augustine's Confessions, Dante's Divine Comedy, and I suspect also Pilgr uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And he borrowed elements of these great works for his tale of a puppet. Collodi was theologically educated. In his youth, he attended an Augustinian seminary. He became a journalist and advocate of reform in Italy. Um, into Pinocchio, however, he wove motifs and themes from these readings that he did early in his life, from the Bible, especially Genesis and the book of Jonah, as well as Jesus' parables, such as the story of the prodigal son and the gospel accounts of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances on the road to Emmaus and in Galilee even the crucifixion, because in the Collodi story, Pinocchio is hung on a tree and wails, Father, where are you? Not in Disney. <laughs> we all begin as puppets, um, marionettes, do we not? Isn't being a child something like being a puppet on a string? What is more? Collodi's puppet is made from a troublesome and trouble-bound piece of wood. Not in Disney's story. An allegory of our fallen human nature. The stubborn, wooden-headed puppet does not listen to his father and otherwise counselors. There is a cricket. He's not named Jiminy Cricket. And he hits him with a hammer on a wall. And he's dead. He comes back as a ghost. It's, it's European, it's not American, it's not <laughs> sentimental. <laughs> Seriously. Americans don't like that. And, and what Disney did was brilliantly recreated Pinocchio as, as an American innocent. And he's not in, in, in Collati's work. Instead of listening to his father and his counselors, he's struck with wanderlust and wanders from home like Odysseus and he wants to return home, yet is hindered by all sorts of external powers, confused and confounded by inner conflicts, attracted to things that he ought not to be attracted to, distractions. He yearns for his father, but must learn how to love unselfishly in order to rescue his father from the belly of a great leviathan. He suffers for his innocence and his misbehavior, a paradoxical mix of childhood, innocence and misbehavior and is hung on a tree to die, but for the intervention of a mysterious blue-haired fairy that is his sister and his mother, could it be the virgin? This would have been his end, and without her guidance and discipline, he surely would remain a vagabond. He calls himself such, and is called such by the ghost of the cricket, a vagabond and never become a true pilgrim or find his father. In the end, Pinocchio risks his own life to save his father's life, sacrifices his own needs to care for the aging Geppetto, and to assist the blue-haired fairy when she falls ill. He has learned filial love, how to be a good son, and for these, good, for these deeds in his good heart, his virtuous heart, and what he has become inside, Pinocchio has been made a real boy with real flesh and blood, though surely even before this physical transformation, he had gained his humanity. Or is this really an allegory of immortality? Aren't we all puppets made of wood, wanting and struggling to become real in the kingdom that knows no end? And what does it mean to become real? Why, be, why to be formed into the very likeness of God? same who we saw in the divine word and only begotten Son of God, 
who showed us what we might become by coming to us in the form of a man. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Geroyan. I know that this talk has probably raised uh, a number of questions in your mind, and so we've set aside uh, a good amount of time here to take questions. Um, so we've got a mic here, and I will come around. If you can just put your hand up, I will come and find you. And one of the things we value very highly at McLaurin is, uh, is pursuing learning in the context of community. And so this is very valuable to us to, to get this interaction and allow you to ask the questions. Do you want to ask? Yes. Up there. Yeah. Professor, you've given us a really great talk to think about with a lot of um, with a lot with a lot of I issues going on in it. And I'm curious as to as someone who works with fifth and sixth graders in in the inner city, I'm curious as to how you see this playing out practically with inner city students, and especially with students who English isn't their first language. English wasn't my first language, so who cares? <laughs> they thought I was stupid. My IQ scores were below average. <laughs> so, uh, but I had a grandmother who told me stories. Stories of the Middle East. C comedic stories, tragic stories. I didn't know whether the stories were real or true. Um, tell them stories. They love stories. Waste your time. Don't use your curriculum. <laughs> Go outside and play. They might get hurt. So what? We all get hurt. I'm being facetious in a way, but I'm being absolutely, brutally honest with you. We've got it all wrong. They can be taught. You're darn right they've been taught. I was, a, I was just, I was virtually an immigrant kid. I used to make fun of me because of the way I dressed. So what? Believe in them. I, I, I don't, you, you have a privilege that I don't have. I've often said that if I could teach again, I'd teach uh, fourth graders. I love fourth graders. Fifth, too, but sixth starts to get, <laughs> too, gets difficult for me. But you see, uh, the really important years are up till about the fourth grade. They're really important years. But then, you know, there's the parents. You know, what do you do with children? Who, I had an intact family. I understand there is a difference. I don't know, there are a lot of things working against what I would suggest has to be done, but I know it's being done at various schools, mostly not in the public schools, mostly in the classical schools that are rising up. I mean, just I was down in uh, uh, Arizona, in Phoenix, where there's a, 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 a group that's started, uh, you should call it a kind of school, uh, Charter schools. They have 10,000 on the waiting list. They're, they're founding 20 schools a year. They're now going into Texas. The problem is they can't, they can't do it up here. The legislation uh, doesn't permit them to hire the way they need to hire. I just sent a student down there, one of my best. He doesn't have a teaching degree. He doesn't need one. He's in a classroom with a, with a mentor to a teacher. Besides, I know he can teach better than most anyhow. He's a classics. Classics and, and uh, language major, uh, uh, linguistics major. They can hire them. Public schools can't hire them. <laughs> it's crazy. Yes? Let's uh, use the mic here since we're recording. All right. Uh, in regards to the moral imagination, I figure part of it has to do with approaching other people as people with different desires and intentions. Whereas, 
so much of childhood in the United States seems focused around the child as decision maker rather than uh, the child as interacting with other decision makers. Uh, I know during, in some children's stories, uh, I know French ones, uh, it's very clear that one person has one goal and another person has another goal. And these will quite frequently conflict. And not in a way that will be mediated nicely. I don't see that in American uh, storytelling. Not children's storytelling, anyways. I don't know. I can't, I can't, I can't answer to the pro professional storytellers that, that visit schools and other local community locations. But I would say that children aren't decision makers. They're explorers. And if we think that uh, they think uh, they're decision makers, or we think they ought to become decision makers, we've made a big mistake. We've made the wrong decision. Period. Yes. Thanks. I have a three-year-old and a sixteen-month-old at home, and one of the questions I have is, how do you um, re restrain to teach our kids the truth of the Bible, and that it's true and it happened in its history? How do you balance that with fairy tales so that it's not a confusing? Some some of our stories are true in history, and some of these are not. Children true. will sort it out. I've often suggested, you know, that there's a long-standing debate within Christianity as to the role that, for example, pagan mythology plays in education. Should it play any role in education or not? There are some Christian theologians right from the beginning who argued that anything pagan was uh, untouchable. There are others who argued, who had been educated as rhetoricians and philosophers in, in, in the classics, who, who insisted that you should read you should read the classics. That, that John Christensen, for example, addressing a parent said, have them read the great heroes of the Greeks because eventually they'll come across the one, the one hero. They'll be able to identify and recognize him. He will contain and have all the virtues and more that those heroes had, and that's Jesus Christ. I agree with John Christensen. And I also think that it would be very profitable to juxtapose classic mythology, certain stories, with biblical stories, particularly Old Testament stories, which have the, which, which have the, the language of fable in them, whether or not they're true. I mean, the language, the, the, the way the story is told is, in a, is, is a way in which uh, um, it's quite comparable to, uh, to the classic legends and myths of uh, the Greek world. So uh, I I I don't I I don't I don't have a problem with this. I I uh, uh, I, I, I don't think that your concern should be so much about that. I think that they will sort it out for themselves living in a pious home. I mean, another question back here. I had a question with regard to the, the stories you mentioned or the stories that that have. You know, from a while ago. There now, there's tons of, if you go to a bookstore, like my children, think there's lots of different stories. There's lots of different books. There's lots of it with, and if you look at some, some of them have agendas. And there's yeah. agendas within those. So, what is your take or what's your uh, opinion of some of the more mo the modern stories and in the, in the literature, the modern children's literature, where, um, particularly the last 20 years, which has been fairly, it seems the like last 20 years is what I've lost track of, so, because my children. <laughs> well, it's short in that period of time. But you will soon. Well, I, yeah, I will be able to catch up. But I can say some one thing. I think that in the 20th century, one of the great achievements of children's literature has been the, big, the picture book, you know. Um, the, the illustrate way you have to actually you might have two authorial voices, the illustrator and the, and, and the writer. And there's some great children's literature that's, that's been produced over the years. One early one would have been, you know, very early, would have been the Velveteen Rabbit. That, um, well, when I taught uh, at, uh, at, on occasion at the St. Mary's Roman Catholic Seminary in the Ecumenical Institute there, I used to get a number of people that were either pastors or nurses and so forth. Some of them worked in, in um, homes for the elderly, and that was a story they used. Because in a way, the Velveteen Rabbit's experience is about becoming old. And it's also about 
how being loved can make you real. And maybe the Velveteen Rabbit is in the kingdom at the end, isn't he? He's transformed into a real rabbit. Paradise. And I, 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 you might, uh, I hope you don't think my imagination is too wild, but I actually believe that that story could only have been created within, a, within Christendom, at the, at the very end of Christendom. Oh, you know, the Edwardian period. So you have to, it's puzzling. I just want to add this. There's so much out there. Go for the tried and true first. Just go for the tried and true first. Uh, and, 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 and don't be allured by all, all, all that's on the shelves. Most of it is junk. Not all of it. I told you. I mean, there's some great children's literature that's been produced in the 20th century. Professor, a couple of times you mentioned Plato's Republic in your lecture. Yeah. And in that book, uh, Plato has Socrates ban the poets, or at least yeah. types of poetry from the city in speech. And my question to you is, do you believe that uh, these stories are the acceptable type of poetry or the unacceptable type of poetry? How would you respond to Plato? Plato, Socrates. I'd read Aristotle. <laughs> I have the advantage of reading Plato and Aristotle. Yeah, that's what I do. I mean, I, I, I don't have to accept everything that, uh, or make judgments about, about Plato's judgments, uh, uh, except maybe implicitly. Uh, I'm not a, a great scholar of Plato, but I've read Plato and I've read Aristotle, and I know they say some different things, and there are tr truth, truths in each of them. So if I read Plato's, uh, Aristotle's poetics, or his ethics, I gain a great deal. I like those. I, I, I like uh, much of the Republic as well, but I don't mean to be facetious there. I don't know how, I, I have to, I'd have to think more about exactly what, what your question is. Uh, it, in, in simple terms, it's, 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 it's not unlike, it's analogous to the point I made earlier about early, early Christian writers and, 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 uh, and theologians as to what Christians ought to be absorbing out of the literature that's in poetry that's available in their, their own time. And there's, dis there's great disagreement. Some, some will destroy anything that's pagan, others will not. I happen to be with those who would not. But I know there are others who can argue the case the other way. It's not to say that I'm not going to be, dis uh, I'm, I, I am going to be discriminating, yes. <laughs> I'll just ask a quick specific question. Uh, wondering if you have any comment on the work of P.L. Travers as great literature for children, all the Mary Poppins stories. Uh, I, I, I read the original, uh, you know, sort of uh, whatever. Not, not Disney. I know, not Disney. Well, I like Disney. I like, you know, when I knock Disney, there's some really good Disney. It's gotten pretty bad in recent years, but there, Disney was uh, brilliant. Walt, and, 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 and they were true to the fairy tales in a way that they're not now. I mean, really, seriously. Uh, the Little Mermaid, the music is, you know, it's enjoyable. Oh, I like listening to it. My granddaughter was listening to it the other day. She was having a lot of fun. <laughs> Under the sea, you know. Um, uh, but, but, uh, uh, and, 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 and I just want to say something about Disney. For example, um, is, was it the first? I don't know. Um, um, that's, uh, uh, was, was the, the, Sleeping Beauty, the Sleeping Beauty or, uh, which was the first? Of Snow. Snow White. Yeah, that's what I want. They ended, the, they, they ended, the way that the Grimm's ended. She's there for three days in the tomb, and on the third day she rises and the prince comes. Prince, the prince, uppercase, the son of God. They ended right. 
they did. They retained that. I don't know who was doing the editing. They didn't have to make. They didn't have to be true to the three days. Somebody was there knew what, knew what it meant probably, or maybe they were just be, being literal at that point. Didn't know what the devil they were doing. All I know is it was retained. But if well, you, the Little Mermaid is a profound story with all sorts of biblical resonances, even though there's no question that Hans Christian Andersen was idiosyncratic as a Christian. Um, he didn't believe in the physical resurrection. And there are hints and suggestions of it in that story as well. But the spiritual struggle that, that the Little Mermaid goes through in his story is true to the, is true to the Old and New Testaments. Um, in some ways comparable to David. It's refusal to use a spear to, uh, to do away with his, his one enemy, the king, Saul. And she refuses to use what she can use to, to uh, save herself at the very end, the knife. The knife, the knife. And her feet, as he describes it, are constantly feeling as if knives are pe piercing her feet but she does not pierce his heart, and she gives up immortality, or so she thinks. So, you know, they, they destroy that story. Um, now, what was, the re what was the real question? <laughs> it's about the original Mary Poppins. Uh, Mary Poppins. I, I don't have a lot to say about that. I enjoyed Mary Poppins, but I never thought about it the way I thought about just reflected on The Little Mermaid. It takes time to think about these stories. If you really want to think about them, then I have to write about them, right? <laughs> so I, I, I didn't get to Mary Poppins. I think it's good, but I don't know that I can argue with someone who has the opposite point of view because I just don't have it. Do you want to say something about Mary, Mary Poppins? No, I, um, uh, other than that, in the kind of Christian great literature or, or lists of books, it's rarely included, yes. You know, in the 20th century, and, yeah. and and I think there's about 20 reasons it should. It should be. Yeah. I'll go back and look at it. <laughs> it doesn't mean that, that there are a lot. There's lots of children's literature that I read that I thought was pretty good at the time. Freddy the Pig. Did anyone ever read that? They were great. Um, um, let's see. Uh, the Lost Planet uh, stories. Uh, um, what was the name of Mar uh, the Mushroom Planet stories? Remember those? They were good. They were fun. They were entertaining. They were adventure. They 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 set they they set a mood. They set an atmosphere, and I can still taste it. So that you know, it's not to say that you know you've got to be a Puritan about this. It is uh, how much of Christianity was in the Mushroom Planet stories? I don't know. I doubt very little. <laughs> but it was fun to read. So. Or Mr. Poppin, what was the name of that Mr. Huh? What was that? Wait, what? So, Mr. Poppin's Penguins, yes. Now, I didn't see the movie, but I liked the book. I think it was a good book. I still think it was probably a good book, but I'm not sure. So I haven't gone back and read it, read it. But you know, that's what I'm getting at here. If you say that, 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 that there's, there's stuff in there that, that uh, qualifies it, in a certain class, if you like, of children's literature that I would be most attracted to in terms of writing about, I'll take your word for it. Maybe it is there. I just, I didn't, I didn't read into it. Yeah, after all, you have to understand, I'm a dilettante. I, I, this, was, this, was, this was work on the side. I was writing books on Eastern Orthodox ethics at the same time. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> right? <laughs> Since you mentioned Buber and you spoke about Freddy the Pig, yeah. if, 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 if by any chance you happen to come across uh, the Three Little Wolves and the Big Bad Pig by Jesus, no, which is an inversion, inversion of the other one, but which basically is full of wonderful uh, moral applications. So, so, so I should read that. 
Well, I mean... Uh, yes, I should read it. You recommended it, I'll read it. You're a young, you're a young man, and I thought you should read it. I'm a young man. <laughs> this perspective, I'm a young man. My arthritis tells me differently, but that's... It's getting harder and harder to guard. Yeah. And I have five acres. Oh, <laughs> good. Yes. Well, my students are coming over in two weeks, ten of them. They'll labor all day from eight to late, and I'll feed them, and they'll be happy. Um, a comment and a question. I read the tending of the heart of virtue <clears throat> as an undergraduate decided to get married, have kids, so I can read them stories. <laughs> worked, out, worked out perfectly. Uh, now I have two kids, they are voracious readers of their own, and so it was a, with a certain Kierkegaardian fear and trembling that I approached your other book, Life's Living Towards Dying, and it was a little Scary. Dedicated to my father-in-law. Yeah, it was a brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, but my question is this. Uh, since we are living in, in an age that has been in a barbarian sense so disenchanted, and we are living in a sort of uh, after virtue, mm -hmm. uh, how do we bring back virtue into the entire discourse? Is this a lost cause? Is the cat out of the bag? I mean, is Miley Cyrus is going to take over the world? <laughs> <laughs> She's a tragedy. She's a tragedy. We're seeing it played out right in front of our eyes, aren't we? And the, and the, and the, and the, people, the people who promote her are just as guilty. And they do it every day. Even by take, taking notice of her. They shouldn't take notice of her. But, but, you know, yeah, that's the world we live in, right? That's whose lives we're interested in. Not the lives of the saints, right? But People Magazine. And, uh, and various TV channels in which their lives are reiterated for us over and over again. That is, the deities of a postmodern world, right? So, um, I think we're in a situation where we're, uh, the church is in a diaspora uh, um, I'm going to be uh, morbid here. A diaspora such that it is still trapped in the body of a decaying and decayed Christendom. That's why I wrote a book called Ethics After Christendom. And we have a problem. But I don't think that the public discourse will be leavened by, by me trying to find mediating language. We have to generate the language from within our, our faith such that it's beautiful and attractive to people who are desperately seeking something that's beautiful. And I really believe that. It came home to me just uh, the other day in my course on sex and creation and Christianity where these young women who have been living with the feminists for four years of their college career suddenly discovered that there was a professor who actually challenged some of their, some of their, some of their premises was offering them readings that they never imagined even existed. And on top of it, they realized already, they were prepared to come to my class. They, knew they, they could take another class. They realized already that, they, that, that what they'd been imbibing um, gave them the ability to vent, but it didn't make them happy. Show them beauty. Because what they're experiencing is ugliness. Ugliness in the world of male and female relations in which everything has become unraveled. And at the end of that class, after I had these women venting this, I mean a number of them, from different perspectives, as very heterogeneous class of 30, I limited to 30 again. I said, okay, so are you telling me, all of you are telling me, there are, there are 30 people in that class, but there are only six, no, five males. I said, are you telling me that it's all come unraveled and all of their heads went like this? Even the ones that were arguing against and with each, uh, with each other. So, there has to be witness. Uh, I'm a conversionist. I say convert, 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 convert. Or there's no purpose or meaning in the church. Yep. Yes? But when were these halcyon? There were no halcyon times. There never were any halcyon times. Well, so, 
So then we're remember I, I teach your... theology. I teach historical theology. You don't think that there there was Halcyon times in the fourth century? There weren't any Halcyon times. <laughs> well, well, right. So yeah. Then, so. so then, where were you? How can you critique this age? Because uh, because I will argue that over a period of time, over centuries, the, the culture was changed. I can, I can argue it through even the uh, legislation uh, that was promulgated by the emperors over six centuries, say, it, it, in the case of divorce. I can argue it in, in terms of uh, how marriage became conceived in the Byzantine Empire from, from, from the fourth century through the 10th century, yes. There was a difference. There was a Christendom. It wasn't Camelot. Yes? Uh, does putting oneself in the mental context of a story imply acceptance of its premises? For example, uh, one can tell a story about uh, uh, a long lost boy who suddenly becomes a uh, the, the cruel dictator of his own little country, and he just turns out to be a nice guy at heart. Does that presume that you believe a person can be a cruel dictator and a good person? Does telling the story imply that you accept that? Well, first of all, I think they can be, because there are lots of sociopaths walking around. But um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I understand. Your, your question is, what, what, what is the premise? We, we, when we read a story, we, we obviously have to engage it in such a way that we live in and through it. But, do, but does telling the story imply that we accept the premise? Who telling the story? The, the, the storyteller or me telling the story? Okay, anybody reading the story? No, you don't have to ex accept the premise of the story. No, I, don't, I don't know what you mean by premise. I don't think any story has a... It, here, here's one of the worst mistakes you can make in teaching literature. Identify, identify the main theme in a the story. If you can identify the main theme in a the story, then there's no need to tell a story. Period. So I don't know that there's a premise to a story unless it's a bad story. We've got time for one more question. Story, story is about, is about the, the, the engagement of human will and a drama that's being played out. It's not a, if there's a premise, it's that. It's about our humanity. And that's very broad. But beyond that, I don't think the stories have premises or main themes. OK, got a last question over here. Thank you very much. Um, I, as a headmaster of a school and the father of five children, um, one of my greatest fears, and I think one of the greatest dangers for our children, is the Susan in Narnia effect. So, um, that Susan gets left out? That Susan grows up. Grows up. And she forgets. She gets left out of the kingdom. Yep, and she gets left out of the kingdom because, so we start working with seventh graders, and they're in the process of finding a lot of these childhood stories. They want to put them behind themselves. And they're not quite ready to, I think C.S. Lewis describes sort of that gap when they're afraid to be children. What do you do for the 13, 14 year old boy or girl who is just attracted to the world? What do you do, are there stories? Do you have any advice for parents or teachers to combat that? So-called adolescent literature. <laughs> well, C.S. Lewis also said you shouldn't write for age, age groups either. So the first thing is don't go looking for adolescent literature, because adolescent literature will, will have a premise. <laughs> <laughs> not just one story, they all have a premise. The premise upon which they were written, which is not necessarily the story, okay? Um, honestly, I can't answer all of these questions. Remember, I'm not teaching primary or secondary education. I'm teaching in college, and I'm writing books on Eastern Orthodoxy, and I'm writing books on gardening, and, um, and I'm writing books on children's literature, and I'm confused. I'm worried about children's literature. Honestly, I'm not. Now, I have some opinions. You've heard them. I don't, you know. Um, but but uh, 
Yeah, uh, look, I, I think there's a, there's a diagnosis there, a, a sort of pathology of adolescence that we've created. We've inflicted on our children. There's no need for that. I can understand the struggle for autonomy and freedom to a certain extent, although not to the extent to which we have in this culture, in which autonomy is, is held up to be the highest good. So that we, we as parents are not, we are raising our children to be autonomous. No parent really wants that, per se. They, they, we should respect their freedom, but we want them with us through the rest of life. And in fact, after this life, that's what we really want. So, so uh, you know, the no, the, 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 to be sold on the notion that we, our responsibility is to make them autonomous, but that's part of the pathology. So I, I, we've created adolescence in this culture in some sense. I don't know that my grandparents ever had an adolescence like we know an adolescence. Maybe they didn't have the opportunity to be adolescents. But when I did oral histories of my great, great aunts and uncles, I don't think they had adolescence. Of course, they had a problem, too. They were in the middle of a genocide, and they were pushing dead bodies down the Euphrates, literally. And the Euphrates was red. Okay? So maybe, maybe that's different. <laughs> maybe that's different. <laughs> or, watching, or watching the Black Sea turn white, not, not because bodies are being thrown out of boats, turn white. Uh, um, I, I, I don't know how I got onto that, except that it's deeply, you know, it's deeply inside of me, all right? But, but it, 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 it's related to how I react to this also. Because I, I think that you have a problem there. They should be able to, you, they should, you should be able to give them great literature, and they should be able to consume it. Why can't they read the Odyssey at 13? What is it that's missing in the Odyssey that they need? Most of what they need is in the Odyssey. So read it. You know, I mean, uh, why can't they read the Divine Comedy at the age of 14? They can't. We, we, you know, that question about inner city, that group that's down in, in Arizona, they go on mission into the uh, um, um, uh, Mexican areas, the Hispanic areas because they don't know that there's a value in the education that they're offering those people. But their most some of their most successful schools are in those bilingual areas. It can be done. I, I, I'm <laughs> it's so frustrating. I, I'm, not, I'm not, not educating at your level. I'm telling you it can be done. Absolutely can be done. Content, content, content. <laughs> Throw out the lesson books. I don't even, in some of my classes, I don't permit them to take notes except in the books they're reading. Try that. <laughs> all right, well, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for your Now I get to announce the winners of tonight's book giveaway. So the first one is the book that covers some of the material that we covered tonight, Tending the Heart of Virtue. And that goes to Emily Johnson. Where's Emily Johnson? I'll just bring it down. OK. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no runner up to give it to. The next book is The Fragrance of God, and that goes to Jennifer Jacobs. Jennifer Jacobs. Oh. And finally, Inheriting Paradise Meditations on Gardening goes to Jim and Caroline uh, Stauf. Okay. So that uh, concludes tonight's program. Before we uh, wrap things up, I want to 
mention a couple of upcoming lectures that are coming up. Uh, I will invite Dr. Stavru one more time to uh, talk about the upcoming Cunning, Cunningham lecture. Uh, thank you. I, I'm very glad that you're giving me this opportunity because I, I too, want in a personal way to thank Professor Groyan for his uh, presentation and for engaging us in the way he did. Uh, it's, uh, I know how tough it is when you are organizing lectures. The people who invite speakers, they pray that there will be good speakers. The people who introduce them, they pray that they will not be proven liars. <laughs> and 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 uh, and uh, I, I I I am very pleased that he bailed us all out very nicely, and I I I remember I said from the little things that I knew about him, I said that he draws on the scriptures, he draws on the church fathers, he draws on contemporary thinkers and theologians, and I was listening to his presentation and praying. <laughs> Please bring an Orthodox theologian. Please bring them. <laughs> and, 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 and he did all that. But anyway, thank you, thank you very much. But I now would like to tell you that a year before we started the McLaren lecture, I mean the Homer lectures, we started uh, a special lecture at the series at the University of Minnesota called the James Cunningham Lecture on Eastern Orthodox History and Culture. Uh, and they are always on the first Friday of November. Always on the first Friday of November. So this first Friday of November, we are having the 19th James Cunningham Lecture. Our speaker is Vera Shilzov from Smith College, a professor of religion at Smith College. Okay. And uh, she will uh, speak on the Romanov family and uh, the proliferation and their attitude toward icons. And he spoke about icons and idols, right? We're talking about the icons now, not the idols. Anyway, about the icons of Mary and Mariology during the reign of Nicholas II. And we are doing it in connection with the Romanov exhibit that's going to take place at the Museum of Russian Art. So I am announcing it, and uh, I would like to invite you. Uh, we usually have about 250, 300 people attending this event, but I'm sure we can, uh, we can make room for you, and there will be a reception afterwards. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to announce it to your audience. The other lecture that I'd like to mention um, is one of the McLaurin CSF lectures that we have coming up. It is uh, Dr. Michael Naughton from the University of St. Thomas, and it is entitled Beyond Career to Calling, the Vocation of a Business Leader. You can pick up a flyer on your way out, uh, which has more information about that. That's on uh, October 30th. And then finally, I'd like to invite you over to our study center immediately after. Um, we're going to have dessert available. There'll be a chance to meet other people in the McLaurin CSF community, continue talking about tonight's lecture. Um, to get to our study center, you'll need to go out the main doors of the student center, uh, take a right, so you'll be going west about a block over to Cleveland, and then you'll go uh, just two blocks south on Cleveland. The address is 1337 Cleveland Avenue. We'll have dessert. Um, it'll be a good time to just continue the conversation. So thank you for coming tonight.